So that one. <laughs> okay. Oh, I guess you have to get in and out to do other things, huh? Yeah. <laughs> She's Sorry. juggling. She's juggling as fast as she can, <laughs> Kathy. She no, I I my brain's not working. When you do a presentation, the presentation takes over the world. You can't do anything else. So I will now mute set. myself and turn it over to Maurice. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So good morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, our uh, Texas Motorcycle Safety Coalition meeting um, for uh, remote and for those people who braved. And, uh, you know, unlike Jude, they braved the uh, cold and the elements and rode across the wonderful great state of Texas to be here in person. We're not going to hold that against you, Jude, but, you know, we'll, we'll just uh, we're giving you both options next time, just so you know. So, uh, so um, I want to thank everybody for attending. Um, and yes, we know a lot of times it's a whole lot easier to join them remote, and that's why we offer that option. So, thank you all for being here today. And uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jude. Um, or actually, uh, I guess we ought to go. You want to do intros around the room? Let everybody know what's who's here. Yeah, let's go. Let's go off. Uh, Maurice, do you want to start? I'm Maurice. I'm your uh, chairman of the uh, Texas Motorcycle Safety Care Coalition this year. Uh, across the table, we have. I'm Stephanie Ferguson. I'm excited to be here. I'm more of your meeting coordinator for today, and I, I do more communication, social media aspects for this project. Uh, if you guys have any questions or need anything, just let me know. I'm going to kick it off to you over here. I am Justo Adaluz. I come from Fort Cavazos, part of the Green Knights. Perfect. I'm David Barnett from the Hill Country Motorcycle BMW Riders around the Austin area. I'm from Hello. Hey, Jude. Jude, <laughs> you're very popular today. Uh, Kathy, if you could look at the uh, participants list, we like to get some introductions online as well. I'll start with me. So, Kathy Brooks, um, the person that tries to put this all together. AJ. <laughs> AJ Mizell, uh, I'm the GM at Plano Kawasaki Suzuki. Been doing this about 30 years and uh, appreciate the invite. Brian. Good morning, everybody. Uh, this is uh, Brian Evans. I'm a uh, station chair at Fort Sam. I'm one of the motorcycle mentors and instructors here for JBSA. Uh, joined once before with you guys, uh, but my, my, uh, Business keeps me going a lot, so I'm all over the place. So happy to join today. Welcome, Chet. We have a Chet out there. Connor. Yeah, some people still aren't finding their unmute button. <laughs> All right, this is Chet. Can you hear me? Oh, yes, yes Chet. Okay. <clears throat> I had to go through several unmute buttons. <laughs> this is Chet Roby from Clean. I am a rider coach for Texas Motorsports. Awesome. And then, Connor, did you find your unmute button? Not, we'll ask Dr. Dan, our guest speaker today. I'm uh, Dan Pedersen. I just turned my camera on. I'll turn it off again. Uh, I'm Dan Pedersen. I live in Michigan. I am the president and executive officer of the Field Motorcycle Responsible for Student and Education Writers. The acronym for that organization is SMARTER. And Give you a little more introduction about the organization when we do the presentation later on. Thank you. And Miss Elizabeth Jones. Good morning. I just jumped back on. I had a call. <laughs> How's everyone doing this morning? Good, I hope. Thank you, Kathy, for having me. And I'm sorry if I missed any of the other introductions this morning. I just jumped off another call. That's perfectly fine. Um, 
Miss Elizabeth is our program manager at TechStot over this grant that does these meetings. Miss um, Laura, if she can speak this morning. Good morning. This is Laura Higgins at TTI. I was hoping to be there today, but I have come up sick this morning, so I'm staying at home so I can keep my germs to myself and not share them with all you lovely people. And Joel Morris uh, put his in the chat to say hello from San San Jacinto Harley Davidson Writing Academy Manager. Welcome, Mr. Hank Waters. Would you like to introduce yourself? Hi. Uh, good afternoon. Or good morning. Uh, I'm on the highway heading south, stuck in traffic, but glad to be here and listen in. Thank you. I just submitted all my And Julia. Good morning, Julia Davies. I'm the traffic safety specialist here in the Bryan district. I apologize for not joining you in person. I'm trying to juggle a couple meetings at the same time, but I'm going to do my best to listen in and get this great information. Awesome. And Leslie? Um, don't have a microphone, Leslie. Well, welcome, Leslie. Um, I didn't quite see where you were from. Like, can't tell if it's Hill House. Um, welcome, all the same. I'm getting into the M's just so y'all can get your, your mute buttons ready. Matt. Hey, folks, good morning. My name is Matt. I'm the legislative director at the Office of State Representative Ryan Guillen. We're chairing the Homeland Security Public Safety Committee. So obviously interested in the subject. Also an avid motorcycle rider myself. Awesome. Ford. Well, I'll say Michael then, Michael Ford. Um, so Ford Strong's from Texas Department of Licensing and Regulation. Um, we have a Connor. Says he doesn't have a microphone on his PC. Connor Lowry, uh, work at Evans Accident Reconstruction out of College Station. Not in person today as I'm feeling under the weather. Apparently, College Station, Brian College Station is passing something around. I'm glad I didn't go visit today. Sorry. Not all of them um, have it. <laughs> <laughs> um, Mike Valentin. Like you're on mute, Mike. Yeah, still muted. Just give us a big wave. We see you. We <laughs> we got we got video. There you go. That's good morning. Welcome. Okay. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. the force is strong. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and Mona. Good morning, Mona Lisa, traffic safety specialist, way out west Texas in San Angelo. Um, Good to see everybody and looking forward to the meeting. And Nancy. Good morning, Nancy Wynn with TechStot's uh, program manager. I'm working the uh, Look Twice motorcycle campaign. Glad to be here. Awesome. Good to have you. Nina. Hello, uh, Nina Saint with uh, Safeway Driving, work on the uh, motorist safety side of uh, this coalition. Um, Rain? Uh, if they take them away and they have to come back, they're going to charge me. Uh, Ricardo, go ahead. Them, 
Um, all I got to do is send an email. I can send an email. Hi, yes, uh, Ricardo Machado. I'm a writer coach uh, in the Central right. Texas area. I I used to go to a meeting when I was living in the uh, Tyler area, and then uh, I haven't been present the last maybe year okay. and a half, so right. then, trying to uh, join online right now, now going forward. Back. Welcome back. And Safety Dave. Are you back in back in Texas yet, Dave? Don't know there. Okay, Cody. Uh, Cody Stewart with the Texas A&M Transportation Institute. I um, do um, impaired driving and motorcycle research here. Also an instructor for the Ride Smart Motorcycle School, which um, we're a little bit different. We don't do licensing. Uh, we do uh, on-track motorcycle riding. And Vicki. There we go. Unmuting. So uh, Vicki Sanfilippo, Director of Accident Scene Management. Um, I'm hailing from sunny Wisconsin. Um, but uh, I like attending these meetings because you guys have a lot of really great ideas. I'm on the Wisconsin Motorcycle Safety Advisory Committee meeting, and um, Accident Scene Management is actually no a national organization, and we're pretty active in Texas. As a matter of fact, um, Joel, who is on here from San Jacinto, um, he uh, um, actually um, hosted a class last weekend at the dealership. So. Um, I like to be part of this crew. Thanks. Thank you. And Mike, I see you got your mute found, unmute found. Yes, and, and thank you for your patience. Uh, hi, guys. And uh, I represent the BMW DFW Motorcycle Club. I'm a former officer uh, in a number of ways, and um, we strongly support what uh, the Texas Institute is doing over here. And uh, I want to say hi to Jude as well. I haven't seen you in a long time, Jude. We haven't seen him in a long time either. Oh, is he doing it uh, remotely? Yes. Yeah, he's remote. Oh, I'll bet you he's doing a Vulcan mind metal. Be careful. <laughs> he's, he's doing the out in there is no reception out here uh remote so he's got to stand on one leg and hold his arm up like this with the phone <laughs> and you know just right <laughs> pull the string real tight <laughs> there you go and ford welcome back good morning y'all uh michael strawn or ford from texas department of licensing and regulation I'm uh, glad to be here today, and uh, sorry I stepped away when we first joined. And uh, but uh, yeah, no, I mean, uh, I'm always proud to be a part of this group, listen in. And if you have any questions for TDLR today, I mean, I'll do my best to answer whatever I can for you. Awesome, thank you. And then Maurice, I'm going to throw it back to you. I think we've gotten everybody that's joined virtually. If not, raise your hand or shout out. And Steph, if you go to the next slide. Um, if you're new to Teams, there's some, oh, back one. If you're new to Teams, there's some hints on how to use Teams to either raise your hand, uh, mute or unmute, drop information in the chat or comments in the chat. We'll be monitoring that along the way as well. Um, and Maurice, I'll throw it back to you. It looks like we had a few more people join. Yeah, in we, had a few, we had a few more people uh, join uh, since we started doing the um, introduction so we're gonna go ahead and let them introduce themselves as well uh we'll just start and go around the room here guys introduce yourself to the group hi i'm i'm um, i'm at helms i'm out of the austin area i ride with independence i uh, haven't been out here in a while he's out here with woody and jude quite often and been a minute and i heard about your meeting it's like a nice day to ride so came out here to get caught up on things james evans uh accident instructor um you know, motorcycle rider was someone who investigates motorcycle accidents for a living. 
Um, so just I've been to some of these in the past, but it's been a few years now. So uh, Nicholas Miller, um, work with James uh, investigating um, different car and motorcycle accidents. Uh, new rider, um, first time out here. Okay, and I'm Pete Rovell from MRH Rider Training in Houston. I think we've got all the introductions. Uh, if if we missed you, uh, please raise your hand or uh, feel free to speak up this time. We don't want to miss you. And we understand some people don't have microphones, so uh, it's okay. Just give us a nice wave or a, a message in the chat. Um, Dave, Dave said his mic is working again. Dave? Dave, want to go ahead and say hi? Good morning. Maybe. Maybe not. Um, he said he's not back in Texas yet, but hopefully we'll be here within the next six months. So we'll be happy to have him back. Six months or so, give or take. So <laughs> next year. Just say next year. That gives you 12. There you go. He said that last year, though. So we got to hold him to it a little bit. And um, Red, go ahead. Shelly raised her hand. Okay. We welcome. We welcome you. Maybe um, Joe Morris, Senior Big Riders Motorcycle Club, uh, Region Three Defender, Texas Defender from C O C and I. Welcome. Thank you. All right, everybody. Well, uh, again, welcome. Thank you. If you've uh, missed, feel free to put something in the chat for them. Uh, get, uh, get credit for being here. You don't want to be counted absent or anything like that. Um, so, um, I guess uh, first thing uh, up on the agenda, uh, see if we can pull the string real tight all the way to Texarkana and get uh, an update from Jude. Uh, everybody's anxiously awaiting to hear your uh, wonderful voice this morning, sir. Good to see you. Well, I don't know how wonderful my voice is, but I certainly <laughs> hope it's coming through. I not only pulled the string tight, I got it wet quite a ways too, so I'm hoping you're getting a little bit of good reception. Um, this is our task force update, and I'm, I'm happy this morning that we've got such a great cross section of individuals and minds on uh, motorcycle safety, because we have, uh, as you can tell from the introductions, we have a, a lot of riders. Uh, we have representative from the legislative side. Uh, we have a lot of traffic safety specialists from our TxDOT partnership, uh, and we have a great collective here. And I was always also happy to see this morning that we've got some dealership representation, since that's the focus of the task force this year, is to try to build our coalition out uh, to include dealership representation, such because they're such a big a uh, safety partner and a big uh, component of motorcycling in the state of Texas. Uh, it's something that we've all always tried to build uh, since 2008. So that's uh, task force efforts this year to try to get that done. Let me give you an update on what we've done to this point. Uh, through a selection process of um, areas that need probably the greatest representation based upon the greatest uh, crash problem. Uh, we have sent out surveys uh, in these several areas, and actually a survey has gone out to 46 dealerships to this point, and we've had six survey responses as, as of this time. Uh, all of the responses that we've had indicate a uh, willingness to participate in uh, both a focus group and be interested in uh, membership or uh, 
at least representation in this safety coalition. So those survey results uh, that we're getting back indicate how dealerships think um, the information should be focused that they would be willing to give out in their dealerships. So it'd be a partnership between TTI and the dealerships to get motorcycle safety specific information out. Uh, and so they'll be able to help us uh, put together, or actually when I say us, I mean TTI, put together uh, information that they can give out to their customers. So, so far we've had six responses. We're hoping to get uh, quite a few more. We really want to get dealerships on board with this program. If if you uh, are aware of a dealership in your area and your area is uh, one of those areas in the state and mostly it's the urban areas that are highly represented in motorcycle crashes uh, and you have a dealership that you think uh, might be willing to participate in this, uh, please get them information on how to get back with TTI. The best person to do that would be, of course, Kathy. And uh, she can put her information down in the chat. And if we have not already sent them a survey, perhaps we can reach out to them personally or get you to help us reach out to them personally uh, in order to get them on board. You know, building building not just safer riders, building better riders is what always has been our focus. And so building better riders builds long-term customers. So I think dealerships are interested in that particular focus. So that's all I have at this time, Santa. I mean, Maurice. Yeah, I'm not sure which list you're gonna wind up on yet there, Jude, so. Um, so I'm, I've got uh, a few announcements to, to make here um, for everybody's information. The 2024 uh, Motorcycle Safety Award nominations are open. Uh, if you go to the website, uh, looklearnlive.org slash safety awards for more information, please uh, look at that and uh, start thinking about uh, who's deserving of those. Uh, the other thing is they watch for motorcycle yard signs are available. Uh, I know they have uh, about 600 signs waiting to be out and uh, for everybody. So let's get them uh, ordered and shipped out to you so that uh, when uh, the spring starts and uh, we can kind of get the message out and have as many signs out there as possible. Uh, they've also got a focus group coming up. Uh, they're asking for riders and instructors um, to give some feedback on recruitment materials. Um, so please contact them if you're interested in uh, being involved and helping out with that. Uh, also reporting, we've had uh, seven new uh, updated uh, TMSC members in the last two months. So. Thank you for those seven who uh, updated and joined as well. Uh, and then also uh, challenge you to go ahead and keep those numbers growing by reaching out to your uh, friends and fellow riders and getting them involved. Um, and looking ahead at the forecast, we've got a, we'll do a meeting in March of 2024. So those are the announcements that uh, I skipped over when I went to that. Jude, <laughs> I had the stack of papers covered there. So, all right. So, um, Kathy, I think you've got the uh, next uh, update for us, please. I will try. So, um, thankfully, we were granted the ability to continue this project this year for 2024, going through the end of September. And so far, we've done. Um, two events. We did our motorcycle events, the Lone Star Rally in November and the Tri-County Toy Run in December. And we're looking forward to the Corpus Christi Home and Garden Show in February and the McAllen Home and Garden Show in March. 
to do more of the motorist awareness side. Um, we're also looking to provide four, at least four motorcyclist safety presentations. So these are based off of the presentation that jo Jude developed uh, when he was working, I believe, as a TSS at TxDOT, and we were able to provide to uh, he he sent it, went out to several clubs and groups uh, a couple of years ago, and provided these, and we are offering them again this year. So we're looking for some groups or clubs. If you have an organization you'd like us to bring out a how to survive the streets as a motorcyclist. Uh, We'll be bringing that presentation. Let us know, and I'd be your contact for that as well. We'll also be sending out some emails to, to some clubs and groups if we don't hear back from anybody. Um, we're also, if you're not aware, your district traffic safety specialists, a lot of them have traffic safety coalitions, and they meet at least quarterly. Um, and so we're looking to do some presentations for those. Right now, I'm still waiting to hear back from Fort Worth. Um, no, waiting to hear back from Dallas, Fort Worth, Houston, um, Austin. Who am I missing? Somebody else already said uh, that they would be, oh, El Paso. Um, don't want to miss El Paso. That will be presenting at one of their coalition meetings uh, this year as long as Elizabeth says yes. And Mona, you are also on my list. So okay, yes, good. I'll be getting back with you as well. Okay, thanks. Um, and then see what else. Okay, so the big thing this year, we're not having our annual forum this year because our big gathering, if you will, is, is being spent on a national highway traffic safety Association um, Motorcycle Safety Program Assessment. So they're bringing in, the Federal's um, NHTSA is bringing in their representative, probably LaCheryl Jones, who is also a motorcyclist and heads the motorcycle park in Washington, D.C. And we'll also, they'll be bringing in a panel of motorcycle safety professionals from around the country to help look else look at our program here in Texas and offer feedback, um, give us kudos for what we're doing well, but give us some feedback as well as to where we might um, have opportunities for improvement. So we're looking forward to that. Yes, Jude. I was just wondering if they've set the location at this point in time for the assessment. We are planning for Austin as being a central to the state, um, local for the state representatives that will need to be there. We do not have an exact location yet. We are working on that, hope to have it by mid-January. We'll be having our kickoff meeting with NHTSA in April. I would suggest Texarkana because it's much prettier up here. <laughs> <laughs> the traffic's not near as bad either. <laughs> Well, that's true. So my question is, is there a really good airport that's close? And is there a nice uh, hotel and, and convention center real close to food and everything? Because these people aren't going to have cars. They're going to have to walk. So <laughs> in August. Yes and yes. And yes. <laughs> okay. um, if they come here, I might have enough motorcycles for them all. So there you go. There you go. No, um, they we're... might not want to. Ride a 125 around town, though. <laughs> All the students do. <laughs> but right Probably in. not around town. <laughs> Everybody loves Grom. <laughs> so, um, no, unfortunately, it is set for Austin, and it will be in um, August, I believe, is the date it's set in, in mid-August. Um, social media. What was on my list of things for social media? I go find my notes. Sorry. Um, oh, yeah. Well, that was obvious. For social media, um, Stephanie, who is also helping us run the meeting today, has been doing an excellent job of trying new ideas and new campaigns on our social media channels. Um, calls to action 
and um, trying to really spread that information exchange base. Maybe some more interactive things are coming as well, polls and feedback requests and so forth. So please keep an eye out for us. If you don't already follow us on social media, please follow, like, share, comment. Um, we are monitoring it and, and giving some comments back and really help us to expand that base because we're we're still struggling to get to all the motorcyclists in the state. There's a lot of them out there that don't even know. When we were at our event, we asked them, have you heard of us or have you heard of our website? And they're like, no. So let's help, let's help spread the word. And social media seems to be the platform of the day to do that. And then one final note um, on the watch for motorcycle yard signs. We have 632 of them that are currently housed in Austin. Um, Please let me know if you or your group would like some. We'd like to make them in bigger purchases or bigger deliveries rather. And we are really looking to also partner with our traffic safety specialists in the district. So we can perhaps use them as the hub if we can get it to the district and then they can, you can pick them up from there or they can help us get them out. We're still kind of working out those logistics, but the sooner you can let me know how many of those you want or need for your group, organization, county, area, um, the sooner we can get them out to you and we can have those um, since we are a year-round riding season state. Unless anybody has any questions, I think that's all I had. Kathy, how do we go about getting those signs? Send me an email. Let me know how many of you you want, who you are, what address they need to go to, what area you're in, and we'll start working to coordinate that. Yeah, I'm part of all the Austin, the uh, the Texas COCI Region One and Core. So most like safety awareness is pretty big with Woody and Spitfire and all of them. I know we had some signs that had some old uh, signage on them that politics said do do not use. So we could use some some new ones. Okay. Um, Stephanie, if you go back a couple slides, I think there's a picture of there's the a, new one on there. Is. Yeah, the middle part looked like it's better. It was a uh, had a confederations of clubs and defense, I believe it was the term, which was an old old thing from the old lawyer back in the Waco days, and that was a no no apparently. So we lost okay. a bunch of signs. So we could use some some new ones. Okay, we've got six hundred of them. Um, where it's all we were able to afford this year so let us know send me the information my neck my information is in the chat we'll go out with the announcements on the website okay. and uh, stephanie can probably hand it to you if before you leave since you're there in person thank you it's a little bit of work but you can actually trim the bottom and still that core blast holds up yeah, I mean, it, it is some work, but we <laughs> talked about it, but yeah, I was like, yeah, I'm not going to go to a couple of hundred signs. So yeah. <laughs> and Miss Mona, you have a question? I do. Um, are you, will you mail directly to somebody? Like, you know, because we, we get calls and then, um, you know, can you, and they want, you know, want it mailed to them. Can you, if I gave you that information, you would mail out to other individuals? We can try. Um, Elizabeth and I are still working out the logistics on that. So you send me the information. We'll do everything we can to accommodate. You got it. Thank you. Kathy, I have a question. Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, on the dealer's engagement, uh, who can we speak with uh, regarding that? I, you, I'm that person too, or Jude. But no, you send it to me. I don't want to put any any on Jude. Jude's helping. Um, do it. We're doing all the legwork and Jude's driving the bus. Okay, good. Thank you. Great questions. Thank you. Anybody else? All right. Maurice, back to you. All right. Um, 
Next, we're going to move on to uh, Dr. Dan uh, Pedersen as president and chief executive officer of the Skilled Motorcyclists Association, responsible, trained, and educated riders known as Smarter. He's got an extensive background in uh, public education, K through Trio, as well as motorcyclist safety education. Um, and Dan, we got you out there. You uh, ready to take over? I think so. Yes. Uh, is that slide up? Good. Yes. Good. Good Lord. The four okay. chances for error. Huh? Yes, sir. We can see the presentation. Okay. Laura, did you put that up? Because I don't think I did. Uh, uh, Dan, yeah, we've got it. You. We've got okay. it up here. All right. So thank you very much. I want to thank um, Kathy for inviting me. And Kathy and Laurie spent some time with me uh, a couple of days ago to try to get me up to speed on um, using Microsoft to share this information. Uh, I, I mentioned in the introduction that I'm the president and chief executive officer of the Skilled Motorcyclist Association, responsible, trained, and educated riders incorporated. Uh, if you haven't visited our website, you don't know about our website, I would certainly encourage you to do that. Uh, this presentation today is going to be in a couple of parts. The first one, we'll look at the, um, the look but fail to see motorcycle car crash. We'll specifically look at the four chances for error associated with that. And then we'll have some time for, for questions and comments. And then the second part, I'll guide you through some of the spots on our um, website where you can find the information. Um, my main task for more than a decade now has been to search for, read, analyze, summarize, and post motorcycle safety research. We have more than 400 research reports posted on our website in 20 different categories. For example, crash causation, lane splitting, motorcycle design, licensing, and, and training. Often during my presentations, I um, will make a comment or say something that might be new, unique, or different to you. Uh, my comments may even run counter to some of the things that you're working on, and that is certainly not to be critical of what we're doing. Um, all over the country, we have dedicated people like you folks that are working hard to uh, reduce the number of motorcyclist crashes and the resulting injuries and, and oftentimes fatalities that result from that. Uh, so uh, if I say something that's uh, counter or different, from what you're currently doing or from what your current thoughts are, uh, it's to nudge you in a different direction to um, invite you to uh, look at what we do in motorcyclist uh, safety uh, programs in a little different way. And the information that we share is based on the extensive research that our organization has. So. Uh, Kathy, uh, Kathy or Laura, if you have if you have control of this slide, we need to go to the next slide. Yeah, back up, back up one. There we go. Thank you very much. So we're going to look at the uh, uh, so-called look but failed to see crashes, and and. Uh, The three, uh, the three items listed here on the slide, um, plus a brief look, like I mentioned, a brief look at our website are the main goals for today. Um, the original concept of the four chances for, for air is from a man by the name of Kevin Williams. Uh, he's a UK writer trainer and a motorcycle safety advocate and researcher. Um, when, when we look at the, our website later on, I'll highlight where his review of the literature can be found. We'll look at the four chances for error and the associated perceptual phenomena. Uh, the perceptual phenomena underlie the reasons that uh, we believe motorcyclist awareness efforts, the traditional motorcyclist awareness efforts, um, are likely not to be successful. 
embedded in the recommendations that we'll look at today um, are our recommendations for auto drivers as well as motorcyclists. And we'll also highlight smarter developed vulnerable road user search system that we call SAR times two. System, we'll briefly look at it today. And at the end, I'll point out where this material is posted on our website so you can uh, get more detail. Our position is that the old uh, uh, drive- Can you turn the volume up? Yeah, Dan, I'm sorry to interrupt, but is there any way that you could get closer to the mic that you're using? It's coming in a little. Uh, I will do that. Is this a little better? No. Oh. So my mic is on. Let me take a look here. Started out pretty, uh, pretty good, and then you got you got a little bit fainter. Is that better? Yeah, I, um, I'm hearing him fine remotely, and okay. so does somebody else joined in the same thing. So is there a way to increase the volume in the room, maybe? We hear you fine. We heard you fine. Yeah, that's fine. Go ahead, Dan. So our, our, our position uh, at Smarter is that the old traditional uh, driver look system uh, look left, look right, look left again, and gas it is long overdue for some changes. Um, we we need something that we focus specifically on vulnerable road users. So if you go to slide number three. So the so-called look but fail to see crashes are primarily in these two scenarios. Those who are motorcyclists, uh, the members of this coalition certainly know that. Uh, since the early 1980s, the main countermeasure instituted by states and private organizations to address these types of crash have been motorist awareness programs, such as look for motorcyclists or motorcycles or look twice to save lives, usually with some kind of uh, PSAs or billboards or yard signs. And you just highlighted that you're doing some of that kind of work. Um, uh, Smarter has not located any published research evaluations of these traditional awareness programs. Few states have collected data regarding how many billboards they've paid for or how many brochures they have been they have distributed. But the reasons for these efforts is to reduce the number of crashes and the resulting injuries and fatalities. There are <coughs> simply no evaluations addressing the effectiveness of such programs related to crash reduction or injury and death, death prevention. We've uh, searched hard to find, try to find research um, uh, that evaluates those programs on the basis of effectiveness for re reducing crashes, injury, injuries, or deaths, and we just have not found any. Um, my personal opinion, and, and I'm separating my personal opinion here from the uh, smarter position from what our board is willing to accept, but my personal opinion is that many of the motorist awareness programs that states do are kind of simply feel good efforts. Uh, but as countermeasures, they may in fact be uh, a waste of time, energy, and effort. That's a nudge, you guys. That is certainly not critical of what you're doing. Slide number four, please. So uh, what we do find in the research is information about how our eyes and mind work together to perceive and that information helps explain the look but failed to see crash and it also helps to explain why traditional awareness campaigns may not be effective our conclusion is that drivers need a search system designed specifically to take into account the perceptual phenomena associated with how our eyes and our mind work together and a system designed specifically to focus on increasing the chance that drivers will perceive vulnerable road users. Um, and uh, in the vulnerable road user category, the tradition is to include pedestrians, bicyclists, and motorcyclists. For lack of any better term, uh, we call our system SAR times two, or SSAARR. -R. You can see that on 
on the slide. We'll take a brief look at that today, but we won't get into any detail. Slide five, please. Thank you very much. Uh, to provide some background, the slide shows six key points. The first is a misperception that seems to originate way back with the 1981 Hertz study, which concluded that approximately three quarters of crashes involve another vehicle. And the prominent cause is that the other vehicle violated the motorcyclist right of way. That's something that we know happens a lot. But these two conclusions have often been wrongly interpreted to mean that three quarters or 75% of all crashes are caused by the other vehicle driver failing to look. Um, the true percentage of other vehicle driver perception errors is really difficult to dig out of the research. It's really difficult to determine, but it's likely significantly less than the three quarters of the time that we often talk about. Um, it might be as low as 20 to 30 percent. Points two and three, while road rage is certainly a real thing, in intentional hostile action is really rare. Blaming motorcycle crashes on intentional hostile action or that every crash with a car is because of distracted driving on the part of the car driver are common ways that motorcyclists um, push the responsibility for their crashes away from themselves and push the blame towards drivers. We certainly know there's a big problem there, but if but from our position, if, you, if we're really going to make any headway in addressing the look but fail to see crash, we need to stop simply blaming the car drivers and work towards something productive, something that's based on the research that we know. Points four, five, and six are all related. Four is critical in our understanding. Our eyes and brain do not work like a camera. Any of you and I, in the inter introductions, there was a number of people that indicated they could work in rider training. Those involved in teaching the MSF curriculum teach this to their students. But when it comes to the look but fail to see crash, motorcyclist safety professionals often overlook what they teach and they simply support the old look twice, save a life countermeasure. Point number five is a related key point simply is not true that if we look hard enough, we will see. Point number six, we need to separate not seeing from not looking. Two are not the same thing. Slide number six, please. Here's a quick overview of the four chances for error. We'll look at each of these individually for now, just a quick introduction. Number one, didn't look. The common belief amongst riders that car drivers just don't look. This is highly unlikely and a belief that we as professionals in the motorcyclist safety business, we need to address. Number two, look but couldn't see. Driver's vision is blocked. Blocked vision is highly likely in many of the crashes where riders believe that the driver didn't look, but where drivers report not seeing the motorcycle. Number three, drivers look, the motorcyclist is visible, but the driver didn't see. This error addresses the material regarding how our eyes and our mind really work. Number three addresses the reasons behind the idea that our eyes do not work like the lens of a camera. There are several perceptual phenomena. Um, three of those are listed there on the screen that likely apply here. And we'll address each of those when we look at the air chance number three individually. Numbers um, two and three together address the look but fail to see scenario. Or as they say in Europe, um, I think also maybe uh, Australia and New Zealand uh, mostly, we talk about the look but fail to see or we talk about, um, I didn't see you. And in Australia, New Zealand, Europe, they go, they go, sorry, mate, I didn't see you. They throw in the mate. So they have an acronym for that. Number four is the look, saw, but misjudged. 
misjudgment is partially due to another perceptual phenomena called size arrival effect, which we'll talk about a bit more when we look closely at air chance number four individually. There's also a significant component of, of driver misjudgment that motorcycle riders have control over. So I'll ask the question, what motorcycle action do you think contributes to driver misjudgment? Won't spend time right now to answer that question. We'll answer the question when we look at uh, air number four in detail. But for you to think about what uh, what rider action do you think takes place at intersections that contribute to drivers miscalculating or misjudging the arrival of the motorcycle? Uh, next slide seven. So. This slide lists the visual phenomena connected to the look but failed to see crash. We're going to briefly address these, uh, but a full understanding of what happens in these crash scenarios probably require you to gain a stronger understanding of these terms or these phenomena than you'll learn today. So I encourage you to dig deeper into these perceptual phenomena. Um, and I'll show you at the end of the presentation, some of this is on our website where you'll be able to find these these uh, more detail about these perceptual phenomena, particularly embedded into the literature review on perception that was completed by uh, Kevin Williams from the UK. Are those words familiar with you, not familiar to you? Uh, I'll let you just uh, analyze that in your own mind and decide which of those terms you know a lot about and you don't need to study anymore. Which of those terms uh, do you need to find some more information about? Number eight, slide number eight, please. So let's look in detail at uh, air chance number one. First chance for air, very rare. Um, if drivers didn't look, no one would get very far. Just think about that. If you didn't look, if you were driving your car, riding your motorcycle, or anybody else driving their automobile, if you really didn't look at intersections, how far would anybody get? Uh, as motorcycle safety professionals, I think we need to counter or correct or respond to the common myth that motorcyclists often repeat that drivers just don't look. Um, or if drivers would just look, everything would be good. Allowing this myth to stand, in our opinion, contributes to not being able to move forward beyond doing what we've always done. And the data tells us that doing what we've always done is not working. On this slide, the words and letters in red designate the first parts of the smarter developed search system, the SAR times two search system. So the two here, um, for, and this is connected with drivers. So those of you who are in the group, I heard several people in the introduction say that they were um, on the driver side, the motorist side or the driver education side. Um, this may be a, this is a, this is a search system designed specifically for drivers. So the first two here are stop and search. We're not going to dig into detail into the search system, uh, but I, as I mentioned earlier, I'll point out where it is on our website and you can do your uh, own briefing. So I'll pause just a little bit to give you a chance to read the recommendations for both drivers and riders here. So leave the slide for just um, 10 seconds or so so people can read those and then we'll move on to slide number nine. So the second chance for air is block vision, and it's a significant issue. Issue, automobile A pillars, the letter A. The A pillar is the uh, division between the uh, front windshield and the side windows. So automobile A pillars have grown larger um, in recent years, in so over the last decade, with more stringent uh, automobile impact standards. So uh, the A pillars are a significant part of drivers not being able to see. They, when they turn their head, they look right into the A pillar. So 
writers need to be, uh, in this scenario, writers need to be more rigorous about their placement on the road. They need to put themselves in a position that they know they are going to be seen. Drivers need to add a rock to their search procedure, rocking forward and backward to look around the window frames, the outside mirrors, the A pillars, trees and signs, et cetera. Et cetera. So with the check it, second chance for air, we're looking at our um, search system for riders, add an R for rock to our SAR times two system. Riders need to be particularly aware of the position they take on the road so that they are not blocked by other vehicles or roadside sound signs or bushes. The next slide, uh, slide 10, is the third chance for air. This is the really biggie one where the three phenomena are the prime explanations for why traditional motorist awareness programs are not likely to be effective. Together, uh, these phenomena explain the after crash, I didn't see him statement from drivers. There's a, a great deal to each of this, these. Uh, Today, I'll comment briefly, or right now, I'll we'll look at them uh, a little bit more detail. And again, make sure you have the, uh, at the end of the presentation, you know where to find more information about this. Inattentional blindness is when we miss things that are right in front of our eyes. Objects are usually unexpected. The old research suggested that drivers miss motorcyclists and motorcycles because they are small or blended into the background. Current research, however, suggests that lack of prevalence, the other word to throw in there would be frequency, lack of prevalence or lack of frequency in the tra traffic mix and lack of meaning are the most likely causes for unintentional blindness. So lack of prevalence, lack of meaning, and unexpectedness is, is a huge contributor to objects being right in front of our eyes, but we not perceiving them. The research says that meaning can overcome lack of prevalence. And that explains why what is called in the literature dual drivers, that is automobile drivers who also have a motorcycle license are much better at spotting motorcyclists in the traffic mix. Um, I'm, a, uh, I'm an antique car buff. And even though antique and vintage automobiles are very, very infrequent on the roadway, they hold a lot of meaning for me. So I'm very good at perceiving in the traffic mix antique or special interest automobiles because they hold a significant meaning to me. So that's a uh, that's an example where meaning overcomes prevalence. The next one there is is saccadic masking. Saccades are rapid movements of our eyes from one point of fixation to another. One of the reasons that our eyes work this way is prevent us from getting dizzy when we look quickly from side to side. We do not see continuously as it may seem to us. We see in snapshots and our brain fills in what's in the middle. You can kind of test this um, by looking in the mirror and moving your eyes from side to side, you'll not see your own eye movement. Somebody else watching with you will be able to see your eyes move, but because your eyes are taking snapshots and your brain is filling in the, in the middle, by looking in the mirror and moving your eyes from side to side, you won't see your own eyes move. When drivers search, they move their head and eyes from side to side. So it's possible a motorcycle and its riders might be lost in a saccade, lost in a saccade, lost in one of those snapshots. Um, and this phenomenon is called saccadic masking, or saccadic suppression. Third one we have here is uh, motion camouflage. And that applies most directly to the left turn scenario that happens when the angle of view from the driver to the approaching motorcyclist does not change. Our eyes and our brain working together are much better at detecting movement than stationary objects. If a motorcycle is approaching a waiting left turning automobile, 
from a nearly head-on position. From the driver's point of view, the motorcyclist remains stationary to the background. While we know that the motorcyclist is obviously approaching, the driver doesn't detect the motion. So that whole idea, motion camouflage, is the basis for the sometimes recommendation for riders to weave within their lanes when they're approaching an intersection. Um, personally and, and with our organization, we don't think recommending to riders to weave within their lane as they approach an intersection is, is good advice. But we do want riders to consider, and riders may want to consider, moving to their right out of the often recommended left turn lane position. They move to their right. Uh, they create, from the driver's perspective, a greater angle of approach, and it will likely increase the driver's um, um, likelihood that the driver will uh, actually perceive the approaching automobile. So slide 11. In this same scenario, we'll leave this slide up for a little bit because there's a lot of material here. Um, uh, rider, riders uh, can also consider high-vis gear and aux auxiliary lights. So that's a conspicuity issue. Um, but uh, the bottom line on conspicuity enhancements is it depends. It really depends on the circumstances. We have a lot of research on our website related to conspicuity, but in this situation, motorcycle and motorcyclist conspicuity have some connection. Um, even though it's um, out there on the edge a little bit, the conspicuity issues do have some connection to uh, the drivers maybe not seeing the motorcycle. Um, so for drivers in this situation, here's the big one that we're putting in. Uh, and this is, this is uh, aimed at drivers. This is the search system. Um, for drivers, in addition to the rocking that we ask them to do while they're searching, drivers need to ask and answer a question. And the question would be, do I see a pedestrian, a bicyclist, or a motorcyclist? The asking and answering is an effective method to focus attention. Uh, it, bring, it, it, it brings to the forefront in the driver that they are, in fact, uh, searching for something particular. They're not just turning their head. They're not just looking left, looking right, and looking back left again and then gassing it. They're asking themselves, while they're rocking and while they're searching for specific distances, is there a motorcyclist? Is there a pedestrian nearby? Is there a bicyclist nearby? So to our stop, search, and rock, the ad at this point, um, ask and answer a question. So for the next one, slide 12. So the fourth chance for error um, is size arrival effect. And here's the answer to the question that I asked you before. Think about whether you got the answer to the question correct or, or not. Uh, the question was, what is it that is under the motorcycle rider's control that contributes to drivers maybe seeing but miscalculating the arrival of the motorcycle? So it's motorcycle speeding. So the, the visual phenomena of size arrival effect and motorcycle speeding are factors in this fourth chance for error, which is look saw, but misjudged. Let's do the motorcyclist speeding first. The research indicates that riders, motorcycle riders, here's a big number. It's a small number, but it's a big time. Motorcycle riders are 3.4 times more likely to be speeding through intersections than car drivers. And that the motorcycle rider's speed is often 10% faster than surrounding traffic. So motorcyclists speeding through intersections likely plays a significant role in drivers turning across the motorcycle rider's path. Size of ride arrival effect is another one of those perceptual phenomena. Larger objects are judged to be closer to the collide point with the viewer than smaller objects, even if the larger object is farther away. We know that motorcycles and their riders are smaller than the surrounding vehicles, so because of size arrival effect, drivers sometimes misjudge the motorcyclist arrival times. 
there are two answers here. Number one, riders need to slow down significantly. And number two, drivers must assume that the motorcyclists will arrive at the collision point or arrive at the intersection sooner than they uh, may think, sooner than they judge. Slide number 13. So lastly, this connects to the um, search system. Lastly, to round out our search system, we recommend that drivers roll slowly for forward. So we add the roll part, roll slowly, not just a quick glance and gas it to give more time. So this slide shows a summary of the smarter developed search, search system. We'll leave it there just a little bit. Uh, probably mostly for those who work with uh, drivers, driver education people. Slide 14. So this slide is a summary of the four chances for error and the research-based traffic safety procedure, which addresses the perceptual phenomena that are most likely the causes of the look but fail to see car motorcyclist crash. We've been asking drivers to look twice for four decades, and there's no evidence of any positive impact on reducing crashes or the resulting injuries and deaths. It takes us time to use the research. We found in the big world of motorcyclist safety, um, the research is research that we have available is underused or not used at all. It's one of the reasons for our website. Um, the research, are, we've become known nationally as the one-stop spot for accessing motorcyclist safety research. Um, we have, as I mentioned, there's more than 400 specific research reports on our website. So we think it's time to advocate for and implement countermeasures that are focused on changing uh, behavior, changing the behavior of the riders and changing the behavior of, of drivers. Um, We'll leave this slide up a, a bit because it's a good summary of the overlapping between the four chances for error and the search system that we've uh, developed. The next part of the presentation uh, will be where and how you can access information from our website. Um, but I think we probably have time to pause a little bit here for comments. Uh, 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 Laura, you may have things, that, there may be things in the chat, uh, but we have some uh, time for comments or questions right now before we go to the next group of slides, which looks at uh, our website and the places on our website so where you can find this information. Comments, questions? Thank you, Dan. If anybody would like to put some questions into the chat, we can read them out. Right now, it's just been, can we get a copy of this presentation? And currently, we do plan on posting it to the website. Yeah, I'd just like to comment that this is the first time, and I'm 77 years old, this is the first time I've ever heard about satanic mass murder suppression, and it answers a lot of questions about not looking and not seeing. It's an excellent point. Thank you very much. So, one thing I, I, you know, and I do actually. I turned my, I turned my camera on. I turned my camera on so uh, so you can see my smile. Um, you, you and I are about the same age, um, and it's not it's not about age. Uh, it's it's about the stuff that's out there. Um, that was uh, uh, five or six years ago when I started digging into the perceptual research that's connected to uh, these kinds of crashes. Um, that was new to me also. Um, our eyes, our eyes, your eyes, 77 year old and my eyes, almost 77 years old, have been working that way for uh, that that long amount of time and we just didn't know it. Thank you. Yeah, no, that's an excellent point. Thank you. Dan, we, uh, this is we have a this is Laura. We have a question in the chat. Um, have you seen any efforts in um, the active driving systems? I'm guessing like some of the advanced driver information systems to resolve the A pillar blind spot, which I'm guessing would be like a like any uh, uh, 
actions with the sensor with with sensors to be able to kind of overcome the, those blind spots that the that the a pillar may cause yeah i'm 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 not i i do not have a lot of detailed information um we do belong to a consortium uh, our organization belongs to a consortium sponsored by advocates for highway and auto safety uh, that keeps us in the loop uh, on on uh, auton automated or autonomous vehicles and uh, the problems that we have with that. Uh, we know that those automobiles are equipped with all kinds of sensors. Um, our, uh, our organization's reason for belonging to the consortium with advocates for highway and auto safety um, it is because we know some, some of the automobiles are not doing what they need to do to be able to uh, detect motorcyclists, pedestrians, and bicyclists, all three of those in the vulnerable category. Eric Kehoe at the Institute for, um, uh, at the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety has done quite a bit of research on the uh, ability of various automobiles to detect motorcyclists, how quickly they detect motorcyclists, also pedestrians. So. I don't have an answer for that. Um, from our association's point of view, our answer is to um, join with a consortium that has more and better information than we are able to get and try to combine with other people. So advocates for highway and auto safety system is, uh, they, they call it their AV tenants. Assist the person at advocates is Tara Gill. So somebody from your organization wants to connect with them I can give you more information on that. Let's um, let's move on, and then we can have some more time at the end. Let's move on, and and I'll just uh, these. I, I I live in a rural area in Michigan. Kathy and and Laura know that we talked about it, so I didn't want to try to go live to our website um, because I was afraid I wasn't going that I would lose it someplace along the line. Uh, so these are these are slides. These are screenshots of our, our of our website, and I'll just walk you through some of these. There's uh, uh, six or eight slides here to show you where you can find more information. Um, so the the and I'll give you the web address again at the end. So um, I'll give you the, this is our this is our homepage. What it, our homepage looks like. Um, and I'm moving my cursor around, and I know that you can't see that. Uh, in the upper right hand corner, there's a spot that if you're interested in joining Smarter as an organization or making a donation, you can click there. Our, the association is a 501c3, uh, so uh, donations are, are fully tax deductible. Um, our, uh, to become a member of our organization, which supports what we do, um, that simply is a $25 a year membership. Um, and then over in the corner is the contact spot. So um, this this slide, uh, a lot of those main menus. So in the main menus, you go from home on the left all over to research and then contact on the right. Uh, many of those many of those main menus have drop downs. So this this is the um, uh, slide that shows you the drop down under the information. Those are topics. Those are whole separate pages. Uh, so let's go to the next slide. This is the this is the research piece. So this is the drop down for the research section. Um, the first drop down says research, uh, and that's an introduction or an overview. Um, and and what it talks about is what it, what is good research. How should we look at research? How should we consider research? And the remaining categories are motorcyclist safety topics. They're all in alphabetical order. Um, and some of these topics also have um, subcategories. Um, so, and, and they're not always listed. You notice under crash causation, there's not only includes crash causation, but it also includes the outcomes of the crashes. Um, the helmet and helmet laws one uh, has uh, eight subtopics under that. So the next, uh, the next slide, slide 20, um, this, this is, um, if, if you clicked on research and got the drop down menu and then clicked on perception, this is the introduction to the perception page. Um, and I'm bringing you to perception because that's where a lot of the research is that made up the 
the um, presentation today. So the next slide. Um, all you do is page down in perception and and the studies under perception. I think there's uh, probably about 20, 25 studies here. Um, all, all the research that we have, these are active. These go directly, almost always directly to a PDF of the research. So what you see on the screen is the title of the research. And if you were active on the screen, um, the 20, 2021, the science of being seen would be would be a, um, an active web link. Click on that link and it would open up the research. Um, this is the big this is the big research study. Uh, this is long. This is a lot of pages, uh, but it's the research uh, literature review completed by Kevin Williams that we have here. Um, and you also see just below that um, some more of Kevin Williams's articles on um, what is the Smith D crash? Sorry, mate, I didn't see you. Or in the United States, the look but fail to see crash. There's some more articles. Then, if you just page down in this page, um, there's the remaining. Um, uh, you can access directly uh, the research reports on perception. Uh, we very seldom uh, post research that's more than um, 20 or 25 years old. We drop them off at some point in time. Um, if the research is older than 20 or 25 years, people often reference it or it's unique in some way, we will post it. But uh, and, and the research is posted in reverse chronological order. So the most recent research we find on the topic, what you'll find first. Uh, the next slide, please. Yeah, so. That drop down, the drop down you just saw again, not only connects you to perception that we just looked at, the other section is conspicuity. So if you would select conspicuity from the drop down menu um, under research, you'll get conspicuity studies. Um, and this just brings you to the conspicuity page. So the perception and conspicuity are the two pages that are probably of most interest to you. Uh, next slide, please. So this is this is uh, opening the page, opening the education materials page. The education page, and I'm talking about the main menu that's been across the top uh, of our home page. Uh, education page does not have drop downs. It's one single long page, and when you open it up, this is the beginning part of it. Uh, the next slide. Uh, if you just page down in the educational materials section, uh, towards the bottom of the page, you find uh, information, find a heading called uh, for drivers and driver educators. And, and so under the education section, you'll find these specific articles. One there is look, looking twice is not enough. That's kind of an opinion, uh, but it talks about um, uh, that we need to do more than just uh, tell drivers to look twice or look for motorcyclists. Um, the next one there is a document. It's not the PowerPoint. The next one, yeah, the next one is a is a written document describing the four chances for error. So if you want to use the PowerPoint that you guys are going to get that that uh, going to be shared for you to access, um, and then also have the written document, the four chances for error. You can read those side by side. That's digging into the material. And then just below that is the SAR times two effective traffic search system that describes in more detail the traffic search system that we've talked about. And then there's one more down there that you might want to read, read about. That's not a smart, those, the, the ones I just talked about are smarter documents. Um, the one on killer pillars is an outside link to, um, to, to describe more information about the uh, A pillars and and how they're creating huge black vision, huge blind spots for us. Uh, so uh, yeah, the next the next slide. This is me. Uh, so here's the here's the main website. So uh, smarter-usa.org is who we are. Um, that opens up to the home page that that we just talked about. My name is Dan. Uh, my personal email is there, and um, wow, look what I did to that slide, the bottom one. 
uh, I just noticed that it's not it's not double A's. So if you look at our Gmail address, it is in fact smarter USA at Gmail. So um, Laura, can you just reach out and cross out on the slide? Uh, cross out the double A's and correct my spelling for me. She, she put it in the uh, she put it in the chat. I put it in the chat. <laughs> Correctly. In the chat, yeah. So, and we'll correct uh, it uh, before we put it up on the website. Yeah, there you go. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, you can contact me uh, either either at my per personal or the Smarter USA Gmail address. Uh, and if you go to the website, uh, there's a there's a contact, there's a way to just type in your information um, and we access that also. So thank you guys very much for inviting me today. Uh, I think we we'll probably have time for more questions or comments. Uh, James can. Evans, oh, go, ahead. Uh, go ahead. This accident reconstruction and, and of the, uh, you know, looked but failed to see uh, type category. One thing I've run into a lot are, um, I guess you say the human factors aspect of things where people look and, uh, but they just don't recognize a pattern. People don't, aren't into motorcycles, just don't recognize something as a motorcycle. Um, I've got cases, I've got one case in particular where I have a video of a dash cam forward and rear facing um, showing in daylight a, a, a driver of a vehicle just looking forward the motorcycle is, you know, clearly visible coming towards them. He just turns left, right in front of them. And I've had other cases like that too, where someone's looking in that direction, not on a phone. Uh, you know, some of it could be the inattentive blindness, but some of it is just how you see something and how it recognizes uh, uh, to people who aren't interested in motorcycles. Does that make sense? Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, it's it's why we are bringing forward these various perceptual phenomena. Um, it it it, it often is not just one. We couldn't. We we might not be able to say this is an obvious example of inattentional blindness. Um, we don't know. Is it an overlapping between inattentional blindness uh, and maybe saccadic masking? Um, you know, is is it is is it is it something else? So, but it, but you clearly identified and you have video evidence that the motorcyclist was visible from the automobile and. And the driver did not perceive that, um, and that's why that's why um, we developed um, the search system for drivers. Um, and and uh, and in this case, uh, we don't. It's it's not that the driver didn't stop. It's not that the driver didn't look. It's likely that the driver didn't have a focus in their mind. So the two parts of our search system that may have helped driver recognize that a motorcyclist was right there, but would be the asking and answering of the question. Do I see bicyclist, a motorcyclist, or a pedestrian? We also have, we're also recommending that, that automobile drivers search the specific distances. So we ask them to look near, intermediate, and far, and back to near. Then move their head and eyes together in unison um, to, to, to address the saccadic masking issue. Look the other direction, do the same thing, ask and answer the question, rock if you need to look around the A pillars or trees, um, look to specific distances near, likely for a pedestrian, intermediate, maybe for a bicyclist further down the road, maybe for a motorcyclist, and back to near again. Uh, the research indicates that um, drivers stopped at an intersection um, take very, very little time looking in both directions. It's it's look, look left, look right, and gas it. I mean, and, and the research indicates it really happens fast. Um, you know, and, and, and we're talking um, just a couple of seconds. Uh, so, the driver search system that that we're recommending really does slow down the whole process and we want the process to slow down and we want the process to be focused so we're talking about focus to distances and focused on specific vulnerable road users your example your example was absolutely perfect 
there's something else going on that that just telling drivers like we have been since the early 80s look for motorcycles or look for motorcyclists just doesn't work i mean they've heard that message for 40 years well i think that has to do with we're going back to when people see things that their brain has to kind of put the patterns together and some people that don't aren't into motorcycles that don't pay much attention to them they don't react to seeing something uh, they don't identify something as a motorcycle uh, as quickly as you know a motorcycle rider would for example and so they can look straight ahead and just not their brain doesn't necessarily even though they're, they're seeing it their brain doesn't necessarily put the pattern together to recognize that this is a motorcycle um they just kind of glance over it and so that's where um and that human factors human behavior type aspect of things so getting them to look I mean, yes, if they were to, you know, pay more attention, there's a lot of things you could try to do, but just that instinct of looking at an area and your brain not putting that pattern together, um, that's just something that seems like I've run into in kind of cases and some other literature and things. And so I just think that maybe a certain, you know, higher percentage of certain of those left turning cases. If you have pre established a set of objects that you were looking for, you do not see anything outside of that set. Yeah. Yeah, it, ha it has to do. The, the, the latest research on inattentional blindness has to do with prevalence or frequency. So motorcycles, motorcyclists are not very prevalent in, in the mix. So we don't, uh, drivers don't expect to see motorcycles. And the other, and the other one that pop, there are other reasons for inattentional blindness, uh, but the two that come to the surface in the research are lack of prevalence and lack of meaning. Um, uh, most drivers, motorcyclists and motorcycles have little or no meaning. People, and, and, and that, that doesn't mean they don't care. Um, it, it means they don't have experience with them. So they have little, little meaning. So that's why we put the, that's why we, in the search system, we've embedded ask and answer the question. It forces your brain to think about those vulnerable uh, road users that may in fact be uh, right in your line of sight. One of the, I'll, I'll throw something else out here for you guys. It's just a general thing that our association has been working on for a long time. And um, you probably heard in my language, I've, I've, I've uh, I focus on trying to use the word motorcyclist or the phrase motorcycle rider. I have a little presentation that I sometimes make that I say after after you've invited me, after Kathy and Laura have invited me and you guys have been so kind to let me be here, I'm gonna tell you um, I don't I don't care about motorcycle safety. Um, I know that motorcycle education and training doesn't work. And I certainly don't care about motorcycle fatalities. Here's the punchline. I can keep my motorcycle safe by keeping it locked in the dry, locked in the garage. <laughs> I've tried to educate and train. I, I've owned a lot of motorcycles in my life. I've tried to educate and train my motorcycles, but they're dumb as stones. They've never learned anything from me. And in the old days, when my motorcycle died, um, which happened much more in the old days, I worked to revive it and bring it back to life. I haven't had a motorcycle die on me in a long time. None of you people are sitting in this room or joining by, um, by remote today because you care about motorcycle safety motorcycle education or motorcycle fatalities, you're all here because you care about people. You care about motorcyclists and you care about motorcycle riders. So our association has been working for um, almost a decade now, try to get people to substitute whenever appropriate, to substitute the, the two Two words motorcycle rider or the one word motorcyclist in place of the word that we use often use which is motorcycle um, 
I, I don't care about motorcycle fatalities. I care when motorcycle riders or motorcyclists die. So we do that because we, we, we it's, it's a very simple language thing, but I think it's something that, that we, can, we can do ourselves today. You can do before you leave the meeting room today. You can start talking and, and it'll take a while because you have to self-correct yourself. I've done that. I've self-corrected myself many, many times over the last years, changing, um, changing the language from motorcycle safety to motorcycle safety. You have some mix in in the material. I, in the material you shared today, uh, you had some mix of the terms. In some places, you you're the motorcycle safety coalition. Um, but one of the slides that was up earlier, you were doing motorcycle safety presentations. So it, I don't know whether uh, I I don't know whether it works. I think it can work. I think it can get people to uh, to understand why you as a group has such a passion. It's because you care about people. Your care isn't about machines. You have a passion for the machines. I know you have a passion for the machines, and you have a passion for riding the machines. But you do what you do because you care about people. Dead silence. Does that mean like I preached enough? <laughs> <laughs> You're great. Any other questions? Uh, submit them in the chat or raise your hand. But I think no. I have a question. Oh, we got to go ahead. Uh, you talked earlier about um, uh, your recommendation to ride to the right of the lane when uh, approaching an intersection as opposed to weaving uh, uh, to increase um, approach angle. So how does that play with the uh, field of view of the uh, the driver of the uh, car or any type of vehicle? So there, there, there are um, our, our eyes and brain work best to detect motion. Uh, so so uh, if a if a motorcycle if it if this is mostly the left turn scenario. So if I'm in my car and I'm sitting at the intersection preparing to turn left, I'm looking, I'm looking straight out down the road. And if the motorcyclist is in the left third of the lane, the motorcyclist is, is coming at me, the driver, almost in a direct straight line. And, it's, and our eyes may not detect the movement of the motorcycle. Um, we we may see a dot out there someplace. We may actually see that person, but our eyes and brain may not detect movement because the motorcyclist, from the driver's point of view, there is no background change to the motorcyclist. Background remains stationary, so the driver might fail to detect movement of the motorcycle, the forward movement of the motorcycle, or certainly maybe fail to detect the speed of the movement. So um, we just don't like the idea of, of recommending the motorcyclists as they approach an intersection, very hazardous spot that they begin weaving in the lane. It could work, uh, but our recommendation might be for the motorcyclists to move out of the left third of the lane and move a little bit to the right. Changes the angle from the driver's point of view, and it's more likely that the driver will uh, recognize the movement when the angle has changed a little bit. We also ask drivers in the in the search system, drivers who are parked and waiting to do a left turn. We also ask them, and it, it's not clear on the on the information I shared with you today, but we also ask them now to rock side to side. So uh, when they're trying to look around a pillars and um, trees and signs, they're rocking forward and backwards. But now when they're sitting at the ready to make a left turn, we ask them to move. I'm doing it on the screen. We ask them to move this direction side to side as they're looking down the road and as they're asking and answering the question, do I see a motorcyclist? It changes. If the driver rocks from side to side, it changes the line of their vision 
similarly to if riders were weaving within their lane. We'd but, rather riders slow down and prepare to stop than focus their attention on weaving as they approach. Oh, and by the same token, a small amount of weave changes the headlight in that motion. When I mean, you're talking about changing lane position from the left to the right portion of the lane so that you have more perception of the motorcycle approach, you know, angle and motion versus to me, a headlight or just a bicycle rocking while coming, you know, a small amount of weave is going to call a lot more attention to something noticeable, just a change, uh, you know, you could say a headlight modulation or something like that, but just anything that extra motion to me is going to be a much bigger uh, perception issue than changing body position within a lane. So, I mean, I, I, my focus tends to be on the motorcycle, what they can do to help. You know, I don't want to rely on the person in the car um, to try to improve their driving. I want to see what I can do to help on my end. Um, and to me, weaving uh, a little bit um, is definitely something that would be uh, to get more attention to, you know, make the person who's driving notice something. It just stands out much more than just approaching another approaching vehicle or something. So I'm just surprised that you're against a motorcycle weaving to some extent, approaching left turners. Uh, we're not. We're not really against it. We're just not ready to recommend that riders do it. And part of the pro part of the problem is um, it is the big education component. Who are we recommending these to, and how do they put it within their riding system? So um, if the rider has already slowed significantly, is prepared to break, and does one or two weaves within their lane. Um, we're not going to say not do that. We're just not ready to come out and recommend that that's the best option. But why do you why do you say you want the motorcycles to slow significantly as you're approaching a normal, you know, city urban environment where there's left turners or left people in left turn lane? You don't slow down at green lights as you're just traveling through intersections. I mean, I can understand being prepared to um, or prepared to take evasive action, but you just can't slow down and, and rake towards the intersection of green lights because there's vehicles in the left turn lane. So I would, I mean, uh, you know, you don't want the motorcycles just, just to break unexpectedly for, you know, at each green light. So I, I, I don't, what do you mean by you want the motorcycles to slow down I want the, uh, as they approach? I want the motorcycle not to be three. I, I don't want motorcyclists to be 3.4 times more likely to be speeding through an intersection than surrounding traffic. Right. I don't want motorcyclists yeah. to be 10% over the, over the speed of surrounding traffic. So oh. when I say slow down, I'm I'm really not talking about um, slowing below a normal correct speed or speed limit for the intersection. I'm talking, and that's just the way I, I didn't explain it clear enough. Um, I'm talking about um, getting your getting yourself um, into normal speed for the surrounding traffic. Don't be speeding through an intersection. I would agree with you on that. Yes. Yeah. Can I make I a comment? I agree with what you what what you said. I we we certainly are not recommending that 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 as motorcyclists approach intersection, they make dramatic speed reductions uh, below normal traffic or anything like that. We're not recommending that. Thanks for thanks for helping me clarify that. Uh, I, I'd like to, if I may, I'd like to make a comment. Please. All right. And the point is, is that going back to the left hand turns, I've noticed behaviorally that I have changed my lane positioning to the right side of the left uh, hand turn. And the reason for that is because there are drivers who are going along thinking that there's an open space. If I'm in the left position of that lane, think that there's an open space in there and try to occupy it while I'm in it. Then in addition to that, uh, smidsy or rocking the bike has become, uh, at least for me, standard behavior. I know, in fact, however, that some officers have taken that as a sign that the person is either inebriated or there's something going on and even per almost charging someone with careless driving. Um, so, I mean, those are the practical issues and the behavior that we see out there, we have to respond with correctly 
because the data that you're developing, Dan, and this is not a criticism, it just takes time to be vetted and confirmed. Absolutely. So um, this is why I think uh, your points that you're making here are valuable to us because we have to be ahead of the curve, if you will, especially with the behaviors, many behaviors we're facing out there. You know, this is like lane splitting. Everybody talks about, oh, let's do lane splitting, all that kind of stuff. However, in urban areas, you get a weird combination of rushing and angry people. And that makes motorcyclists more prone to being a target, an unintended target, but a target just the same. Um, and yes, we got these guys on crotch rockets running around, but you know what? Maybe our uh, communication channels through the Institute would be helpful there to them. That's it. Thanks. Excellent. I, I mean, perfect points. I appreciate you sharing that. One good thing about also about the being in the right portion of the lane that you talked about, one advantage of that is that you have more time um, for the car to pull out so you can, you're further away from the car. So that's one advantage to what you're talking about being in the right portion of the lane versus the left portion, because um, it gives you more time to um, for the car to pull, make the left turn to see it pulling out and avoid and stuff. So, so being in the right portion of the lane when you have a left turner is, a, is normally a good thing. So. You've created a, a a space cushion as we talk about in in the MSF curriculum material. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Questions, comments? Raise your hand, put it in the chat, or just speak up. Okay, great, thank you. Hey, thank you guys. Um, Kathy, Laura, thanks for inviting me today. Um, if, you, if, uh, if you correct my bad spelling down there, I don't know how I did that. Uh, I run spell check, but obviously it doesn't care about that kind of thing. Um, and uh, I'll correct it on my, on my own version. And uh, feel free to, uh, feel free to email me uh, questions. And please visit our website. There's lots of stuff there. Um, roam around, dedicate some time just to browse and, and orient yourself to the material that's there. Um, Laura and Kathy, thanks very much for inviting me today. Uh, if there isn't anything else, I'm going to click the leave button. And, um, <laughs> and thank you so much. Thanks very much. I'm waving goodbye to you guys. Great job today. Thank you Thank for you. your uh, information and uh, discussion. Very, very uh, good information that we all need to uh, keep in the forefront if we want to continue to be safe motorcyclists out there. Thank you. I heard that. <laughs> See you. Bye bye. <laughs>
You may be there because you're entering into an extremist situation, whether it's because of your own inattention or poor riding or other influences that are pushing you toward the center or toward the edge, then it's the wrong time for you to lose approximately 20% of the contact patch of your tire, which is what happens when you go over cut out rumble strips. Most people are very, very amazed when they see how tiny the contact patch is, even on the modern tire, which is twice the size of what most of us started riding on. You are literally losing, in some cases, up to 20% of your contact patch when you go over those cutout rumble strips. And this is, I spoke with Jude about this once several years ago, and the consensus was that pretty much when they design roads and the safety features of roads, they are designed strictly for multi-wheel vehicles and not for motorcycles. So that is just something that I think needs to be really socialized a lot more in the motorcycle community as the prevalence of the rumble strips increases. Used to be they were done by ridging. Now it's done by undercutting. Your contact patch can ride over a ridge and still land, but it can't do anything about just a total lack of pavement. So I just think that's something that needs to people need to be more aware of. What would your solution to that be? I don't have one, and okay. I'm not sure there is one except be aware of it. Oh, the two times in your riding, it's, everybody's talking about lane position. People want to cut the lanes up into thirds and things like that, which to me is you get so fixated on that. But just everybody needs to be aware as you approach the center and as you approach the folk, what well, I'll just call the fog strike whether it's an intentional or not, you stand a very good chance if you were riding at anywhere near your centripetal limits and counting on what your tire is telling you, you're going to start getting some totally different information from that tire as soon as you're into that rumble strip area. And if you're riding 80% of what the tire will do, and all of a sudden you lose 20% of the contact patch, the mathematics get pretty... Pretty gruesome at that point. It's always just a trade off, though, you know, as oh, far as Silver Rock can be over. The amount, of time, <laughs> the amount of times that maybe it's going to prevent someone from coming across head on because of the rumble strip or different things like that. Oh, no. It's always a trade off. I, I understand exactly why they're there, and I'm not advocating taking the rumble strips or what. I'm just advocating, especially motorcyclists, have to be more aware that that rumble strip also poses a safety, a lack of safety for a motorcyclist. Hopefully uh, our motorcyclists are staying on the road and not on the rumble strips, which are supposed to be outside of the path of travel. Right. Number one, way. stay in your lane, but then mm -hmm. be aware that that would be a reduced traction area, just yeah. like gravel or other features on the roadway, painted markings, manhole covers, rumble strips. I mean, all those would fall into those reduced category. I see Jude's got his hand up. Go ahead, Jude. Well, I think that's an excellent point for discussion at our at our next meeting. Uh, I would expand it a little bit. It has been quite some time since we've had an update on some of the infrastructure changes uh, in Texas uh, relative to motorcycle safety. So I know TxDOT at one time had an engineer that was on the uh, national uh, conference for those changes. And perhaps uh, we could uh, have an update on any progress that's been made on that particular issue, not just rumble strips, but let's let's talk about all the infrastructure changes. And Mike, you got your hand up? Uh, yeah, uh, real quick. One is the question I had for the speaker before is the rumble strips, if you're approaching them, sh ideally should be perpendicular to your line of travel. The, typically those are used in high cautionary areas, correct? Yes. Yeah, you're not referring to rumble strips because I haven't seen them where they're at, at diagonal to the road. Which whether, would, not you're, whether or not you approach it head on or diagonally, there is that point when your tire is over the rumble strip 
that you have lost a significant percentage yeah. of the contact fracture of your tire. My original point on this was there are times when whether or not it's due to your fault or outside influences that you find yourself approaching either the center or the side having to maneuver. You find yourself in an extremist position, which is where loss of 20% of your, your tire patch could be the difference between keeping the tire on the road or having your ass on the road. Hey, uh, I'm, not, I'm not in disagreement in any way with what you said. Uh, the other point, and Jude brings it up, and I'm glad he brought it up, is this issue about the, uh, you know, road constructions, the changes in the highways. Uh, one thing I would also ask, perhaps at the next meeting, what are the hot zones, uh, safety hot zones within the state? As an example, uh, we recently in our club we had a member that took a 75 mile an hour spill on Route 75 and just north of Dallas which is, I'm telling you, that place is like a motor speedway. It is nuts. <laughs> he totaled his bike. He was lucky to survive. Um, that's one. And then I had a personal experience where I actually had a car put me into an a edge lock. With uh, I thought it was my front wheel, but it wasn't that. It was his bumper pressing against my head, my cylinder head on my bike at 65 miles an hour uh and he wasn't there when i did my head check before and all of a sudden he's there so you know these road construction or what are the safety improvements that the uh, uh, department of traffic for texas is doing is going to be valuable for us to know as a group hey mike uh, curious, have you seen uh, Laura's uh, brochure on um, work zones? Uh, Laura, you're you're online, right? And if I not, am. I mean, she can probably send you a copy of it. She put together some good information. Oh, that that would be great. Yeah, I can we, do that. They they are actually um, printing. The print shop is printing more of those this week because our supply was getting low. So if you're interested in the work zone brochure for motorcyclists. Um, either drop your information in the chat of what you want or send me an email and we'll put it on the list to get some information out to you. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. I want to give you a plug there, Laura, for all your work on that one. So thank you so much. <laughs> Had a lot of help on that. Uh, Kathy, you got something else or were you? Go ahead. I don't remember what it was now. <laughs> <laughs> put your hand back down. Okay, raise that. that. Trying, <laughs> it <trying>. happens. <laughs> hey, Kathy, on the, on the dealership thing. Oh. There's somewhere we can find a, a list of ones that are already on on board. I know, uh, I know, I can see by Central Texas on the way back toward Austin. To yeah, she had a list. I don't know. Put together a list already, um, but she can. I, uh, I do have a list um, of the. I know we probably had like 200 of them, if not more, that were, or maybe I don't know. I had a lot on a list, um, but only 46 of the emails have gone out so far. So, if you'll. Um, Leave it with leave the information with Stephanie. She can provide right it to me, or you can send me an email, and I'll check the list. And if not, we'll sure it's all there. send it to them. If well, you I, have I, a I direct you about sign, if you want to text that as well, that'd be helpful. I'm sorry. I I emailed you about the the signs, so if you can text a list of dealerships, I I'm always out riding around. I can try to hit some to help out wherever we're we're missing it at. Okay, so what do y'all think if I send you? Uh, We'll send out some information through the, the coalition email list. So if you're on the coalition email list, you'll get it. Um, with the information for dealers on we're asking dealers to do a survey. So if you're aware of somebody that you can take it to and we'll provide the a QR code or something for you to provide that would would that work for you? Yes, ma'am. Hey, uh, put a plug in for your dealership to uh, complete that survey and give the, give uh, TTI the feedback that they're wanting from the dealerships. Encourage their participation in this so we get better data from it and more involvement. So please uh, please put a plug in to your dealership. Let him know that you're uh, involved in listening and want him to be as well. Or them, I'm sorry. Him, them. Awesome. <laughs> And I did remember what my question was. Um, Go ahead. 
and it and it's back to Mike. You said uh, safety hot zones. So you talked about you know the high speeds in in North Texas, and I'm, I know we have some of those same issues in Houston where yeah it may be posted at sixty, but they're going ninety. Um, what what exactly do you mean by hot zones? Are you looking for crash hot zones or fatality hot zones or just what? Either one, hot, you know, uh, uh, injuries or deaths. I mean, okay. it, it, I, don't, I don't want to focus on deaths because I think there's a lot more injuries that are occurring in those areas that may not be reported. So they're <laughs> underreported. You know, a guy takes a spill and he picks up his bike and he, he hobbles away. Yeah, those, and those don't we show don't well have because yeah, they don't, don't show up in the crash there. information system. So, right, you know, they, 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 there's always a, a a small error of not reported, but I mean the majority. We we have plenty that are reported. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, yeah, Which, well, didn't didn't that used to be on the the website? Yeah, actually, was it two meetings ago? You should be they, they went videos through videos of, of places that had, oh, oh yeah, like I mean, sharp curves that were a lot of accidents that that kind of stuff. Yeah, that, that somewhere that's still on the website. <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's on the red the, the website under roots. So up in the upper yeah. left hand corner of the screen under roots uh, routes. Um, you can go in there and some of them are there. It's not the entire state. It's just some of them. <laughs> and then um, and that data is updated. We're looking at some new ideas for updating data this year. We'll see what how how that works out. But a couple last minute plugs um, we announced in the beginning of the meeting. That we're looking for. We're producing some more um, instructor recruitment and instructor looking for new instructors. Um, Stephanie's been a, a big part of that. She's got a campaign that we're working on that Department of Licensing and Regulation is currently reviewing the ideas. Um, as soon as we hear back from them, we're looking for at least 12 motorcycle riders that are not instructors. A mix of, let me go back and restate that we are looking for a mix of motorcycle riders that are not instructors and current instructors to equal at least 12 um, participants in a focus group to review the, that material so if you're interested in that um, you can contact me or stephanie or kim and i'll put that in the chat kim is the one that um, is kind of leading that effort with stephanie is the focus group in person or can it be done remotely it can be done remotely. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, for that. And well, I'll, uh, I'll go ahead and reiterate some of those announcements that were said at the beginning of meeting and some people have maybe forgotten. So uh, don't forget the safety award nominations are open, available on the website. The yard signs are available. Contact Kathy for coordinating shipping out to you. Um, the focus group that you just mentioned uh, and membership. So when you're visiting your uh, dealer, uh, go ahead and put a plug in for them, getting them to sign up and join and uh, be a member. Um, so that's a recap of our uh, announcements there. And thank you. Good job. Look at you on the spot with that. And I'll leave it open for a couple minutes on other suggestions or comments. And I think, uh, but board strong. Go ahead, sir. Yeah, I was just, uh, I didn't know if Kathy saw it in the chat while she was talking, but um, we did actually review y'all's proposal and information uh, this morning. And uh, Derek sent it over to you. So uh, we, we're ready to rock and roll. Looks good. Awesome. And you have any other? Uh, Things you want to share with the group, or we got a lot of changes on the spot. You just, you know, <laughs> yeah, no, uh, you know, we've got a lot of changes. Uh, January first is a new rule, uh, new rule sets for us. I um, actually spent the morning preparing a lot of uh, public outreach uh, messages that we have coming out. 
uh, you know, some of the big changes on incident reportings are moving to injury reports to TDLR. So you're not going to have to report to us every time a motorcycle, you know, tips over, falls down, you know, during regular training. Doesn't change your your reporting requirements to your curriculum providers, but to TDLR at least uh, less paperwork. Um, of course, we want everybody to review the rules that came out. Our commission adopted them. I believe it was December. I forget now, seventh or something like that, uh, a week ago, and uh, so. We should see probably the new rules uh, officially posted uh, or officially available to, to view sometime probably next Friday and then on January 1st they go into effect, which is also going to change uh, where we created a essentially a new license type for instructor training providers across the state uh, for motorcycles. So not all motorcycle training is happening through Teeks anymore. Um, anybody that holds the correct credentials can now actually uh, sign up to become an instructor training provider at that point in time. So we should have a lot more training opportunities across the state. Um, you know, as that's a statute and we can't release information, uh, you know, ahead of time, we're not able to pre-register anybody for that or kind of take applications. But January 1st, that is all scheduled to be up on our website and ready to go. Awesome, thank you. I know you all have been very, very busy because that's a a large number of updates that y'all were dealing with and processing. We appreciate all y'all's uh, diligence and hard work on uh, making those things happen. Literally could not have done it without y'all, without our advisory board. So really appreciate all the feedback and comments and everything that we got. Uh, you know, every time we do a rule set and we we revise this program, we're hoping that. Um, you know, these these changes are positive and it starts working better for the community. And, uh, you know, we hear all your concerns about the driver education stuff. I'm writing notes down while we're, we're going through here. And uh, those are all concerns we take back to our driver education uh, traffic safety advisory board. Uh, we're looking at updating our curriculum as well as putting some of that in chat. Uh, we're looking at expanding the time the schools have to talk about. Uh, interaction with other roadway users, which would be motorcycles, police officers, you know, oversized vehicles, things like that. Vehicle technologies. Uh, we see a lot of individuals uh, may rely solely on things like, uh, you know, lane departure warnings or uh, they're, you know, not using mirrors anymore because the, their car tells them if somebody's there by beeping at them. But, you know, maybe those won't work with motorcycles. Maybe they don't sense them. Uh, we we definitely want to make sure people understand technology limitations, how those things interact with other users on the roadway, and uh, because you know while we can do everything as motorcyclists to be as safe as we we are, and I heard somebody saying this earlier, uh, they're concerned about how they can take care of themselves. It's also our charge to make sure that the the drivers that are out there, um, you know, in these big vehicles, you know, they're getting heavier and deadlier. Um, you know, we want to make sure that uh, that they're practicing safe practices or driving habits as well. Uh, you know, we need we need safety across the board, whether it's TxDOT, us, education. Um, so we're we're definitely looking into all that as well. Thank you. Thank you very much for that update and information. Anybody else? Give me another minute, maybe. <laughs> I, I have a question. Um, do you all yeah. like the mixed in person and virtual option? Yes. Oh, yeah. The ones in this room are all having all the fun. So <laughs> I requested Jude be here for now on the. Oh, uh, oh. He gets the on the <laughs> Jude, Jude, they want you live and in person. So, but you know, your suggestion could be that. The next live in person be in Texarkana, so I'm just you know. <laughs> yeah, or, or at the uh, Texas office in Atlanta, Texas, which is only a couple of miles from me. Atlanta. different. Go to Mount Vernon. <laughs> How about Tyler? Wow. Get you in the middle. Yeah, we could do Tyler too. Beautiful. <laughs> uh, then, then, then I'll definitely be virtual too because I didn't want to do the four hour drive to Brian today to be there and four hours back. So. Well, we understand we're, we're moving the opposite direction for you, so I, I'm not expecting you to show up there. But now if we go Corpus, you know, I'll then, be there. Yeah, see, and Jude will Thanks. probably give you that same answer. I don't he don't want to go all the way down there. So Corpus works really well for Kathy and I. 
<laughs> Just saying. Oh yeah. We can get a two for one on that one. All right. So well, I don't see any other hands or comments in the chat. Um I'm gonna go ahead and say we gotta adjourn. Thank you all for your attendance and participation and information. Keep uh, doing the good work and uh, we'll see you next time. Anything else, Kathy, that you need to be said? Yep, next meeting's planned for March. So um, keep information coming in. If there's anything you wanna share with us, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, hey. Jeff, you gotta... Jeff just raised yeah. a hand. So Jeff, you got something? No, nope, just making my presence known. Oh, hi. <laughs> Another way. Raising your hand. I'm waving. Good to see you. Thank you all. Um, hey, truly everybody. appreciate your your cooperation and and everybody being here today. Um, Thank you. I love seeing the bigger the bigger responses. We kind of let's keep keep this meeting growing more and more. So share the information with others. Thank you. Good job today, guys. Hey. Bye, right. guys. Yeah, we can have the party, right? All right. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all weren't supposed to hear that, were they? Okay. So. <laughs>